first look here at uh, the damages yeah. here. When it comes to Donald Trump, mm -hmm. we know Letitia James had asked for $370 million in damages. Yeah. Uh, what did the judge rule? So, so far, David, our team's quickly done some math. It appears the former president is on the hook for $354 million, obviously below what Letitia James was seeking after these months of proceedings that happened in downtown Manhattan, but nevertheless, a significant amount of money. David, as our team is pouring through this ruling from the judge, it also appears that Donald Trump's two eldest sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump, who were running the company while their father was in the White House, both boys, David, on the hook for $4 million apiece. Now, the other part of this ruling from the judge, 92 pages that our team is pouring over at the moment, it says that Donald Trump cannot do any business related to real estate in New York for three years, and each of the boys, each two years apart, can also not do business in New York. David, in talking to sources around Donald Trump for the last couple of days, there was a little bit of optimism among the Trump family that maybe the boys would not be built into this ruling with dad because of some of the comments that the judge had made over the weeks long proceedings that maybe the boys would be held out of it. That could be a way to keep the company going, if you will, just basically take everything that was under Donald Trump and slide it to his children. But this ruling, David, makes that impossible. It means that Donald Trump and the boys cannot do business in New York. And I can tell you, David, that one of the things that was being considered amongst Trump Tower is if that was to happen, what would happen to all of the employees of the Trump organization? That has been a big concern, David. So let's just bring the audience back up to speed here. John, stick with us here because, again, the judge here in New York City in the civil fraud trial against Donald Trump has now uh, handed down the ruling, the damages here. And as you heard John uh, just report, our investigative team uh, pouring through uh, the decision from the judge. Uh, initial read of this shows that the former president, Donald Trump, uh, has been fined $354 million dollars. Uh, for civil fraud. Letitia James, the attorney general in New York State, had asked for $370 million. The judge coming very close to that, $354 million. As John just reported there, it would appear uh, at this point that each of the eldest sons, Don Jr. Uh, and Eric Trump, have both been fined $4 million each. So do the math there. That's 354 plus 8 million gets you up to 362 million or so uh, in damages against both Donald Trump and his two sons. And as John points out, uh, all three of them, uh, according to initial reads of the ruling here, uh, have been prohibited from doing business in New York State for uh, several years to come. Uh, that's your read as well, Aaron Katursky. David, this is not ruinous for former President Trump, but it is incredibly punishing because he, his children, executives at his company have been held liable for a decade's worth of business fraud. And the judge, uh, in addition to enjoining them to prevent them from doing business in New York for a few years, has also taken aim at all of Trump's defenses, writing that total repayment of loans does not extinguish the harm that false statements inflict on the marketplace. Trump had said, no harm, no foul. I paid back the loans. Uh, the valuation of real estate is more art than science. But the judge writes that New York means business in combating business fraud. And indeed, the common excuse that, well, everybody does it. The judge says is all the more reason to strive for honesty and transparency and to be vigilant in enforcing the rules. All right, stick with us here. I want to put this up on the screen, this graphic. Uh, the control room can help me out with this. An example of one of the properties, Mar-a-Lago, which everyone knows. Not only were these New York properties, and many of them are established properties. People would know them in New York City and even beyond. But look at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, they had claimed that Donald Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth $600 million. Uh, the appraisal uh, in Palm Beach for that same property, the assessed value, was just 27 million. So again, saying anywhere up to 600 million was the value when in actuality it was 27 million. And this is what the attorney general was getting at, Aaron, is that uh, that kind of exaggeration, even if the argument is who did it hurt, well, the attorney general said it hurt, it hurt the marketplace, other businesses in the marketplace. And if uh, the average Joe or Jane out there in America can't inflate the value of their home or their business, then Donald Trump and his sons shouldn't be able to either. That's that was right. the argument. That's, that was exactly the argument. You and I can't lie about our finances to get a mortgage, so Donald Trump shouldn't be allowed to do it either. And there were repeated examples, not just Mar-a-Lago. There was his Fifth Avenue penthouse apartment in Trump Tower 
on his financial statements, former President Trump tripled its size and therefore its value, said it was 30,000 square feet. It was about 10,000 square feet. His Seven Springs estate in suburban Westchester County, north of New York City. The Trumps said it was $261 million. The assessed value is below 30 million. And these exaggerations, the judge said, are not mere mistakes. It's not just differences of opinion. It's outright fraud. When you talk about how many years they've been prevented from doing business in New York, I'll bring this back to John Santucci. It wasn't for you know the uh, the rest of their time. Actually, uh, as businessmen, uh, when you look at these, uh, the age of the sons, obviously, when they're told a couple of years each prevented from doing business. But Donald Trump, and there's been a lot of focus on the age of the candidates in the race for president, both uh, President Biden and mm -hmm. former President Trump. When you're talking about Donald Trump, uh, whether he wins or not, if he doesn't win, being prevented for, from a number of years from doing business, th that would be a substantial punishment uh, as well, just simply given his age. Yeah, obviously, David, and obviously, you know, the Trump Organization, what it looked like in 2015 is very different than what it looks like now in 2024. I mean, Donald Trump talks about the golden escalator ride he took when he lived in Manhattan. Donald Trump is no longer a resident of Manhattan, moved his, uh, obviously, his life down to Florida. All of his children now reside in the state of Florida. They all at one point lived in New York. David, I can tell you just as you were coming to me, I was hanging up the phone uh, with Eric Trump, uh, one of the president's sons, obviously, who's a part um, of this ruling by the judge here in New York. Uh, David, Eric Trump telling me that uh, the ruling, in his opinion, is a total joke, called it insane, uh, said it feels like, David, they're living in an alternate universe. And David, one of the things that Eric Trump pointed out to me just now on the phone uh, is that, you know, as he testified under oath, he remains and, and continues to stand by his testimony that he does not recall, uh, you know, ever believing any of the information he was signing off on uh, was fake, was altered, was, was any type of scheme. So obviously, as we expected, and Eric Trump just confirmed to ABC News, the Trump family, David, is already saying they will appeal this decision by the judge, and obviously we'll have to see how quickly they move on that. And what's their defense? And I'm sure you didn't have time to get into it on the phone, but when you talk to the Suns, for example, this yeah. argument from Letitia James that they were operating in some sort of alternate universe, that's the allegation here, that they yeah. were inflating assets in a way that the average American just isn't allowed to do. Yeah, and, and David, th their argument is that they maintain that they ran a clean business. They point uh, to, you know, different sales and transactions they've had that have been a success. One of the things that Donald Trump and both his children have pointed out to me over the years uh, is the recent sale he had of the old post office, David, the former president making over $400 million on that sale after he had refurbished the old post office and eventually sold it to Hilton. So that's one example they point to, David. These were properties uh, that were sought out by others when they did sales. They also recently point to a golf course here in New York that they sold for New York residents, the one where you drive over the Whitestone Bridge. They recently sold it to one of the casino giants uh, for, uh, I'm told, just under $100 million, David. So that's the, the success that they point to. These were properties and assets people wanted. So thus, in their mind, the evaluations that they attached to them were legitimate. One quick question, John, for you before yeah. we move on to the rest of the team here and then get it back to our, our stations across the country. When you're talking about $354 million in fines yeah. for just yeah. the former president uh, alone, put this in perspective. How sure. much money have they spent, uh, has the former president spent on legal bills already, the number of cases that he now faces uh, while he's uh, running for president? Uh, how much of this money is actually coming from people donating to the campaign, actually footing the bill for these legal bills? David, a lot of it. I mean, if you look at calendar year 2023, when you, Aaron, I, all of us were on the air going through the series of indictments, Donald Trump was expanding how many lawyers were on his payroll. And we know, David, because of those campaign finance reports that just came out over the last couple of weeks that we reported on the show with you a few weeks ago, that Donald Trump and his team have spent over $50 million dollars on legal fees, on attorneys. Some of the attorneys, David, that worked on this case, the New York Attorney General's case, made millions of dollars directly 
because of their work for Donald Trump. And you have to recognize, David, look at just the last few weeks of coverage we've been reporting here on ABC. Donald Trump's legal troubles, we know the courts at the moment, right? Manhattan, Georgia, the two federal probes. But look at just a couple weeks ago. Donald Trump's team was in New York, it was in the Supreme Court, rather, focused on the 14th Amendment appeal. New lawyers were brought on for that, special attorneys that were barred to appear before the Supreme Court. You got to know, David, they too were dipping into the campaign cash. Not only that, but the E. Jean Carroll case in recent Absolutely. weeks and the amount of money uh, uh, fined in that case as well. A lot of people are going to start adding up these kinds of numbers and, and simply ask, where is this money going to come from? Absolutely, David. And I think that's the thing. Look at where it has happened every time Donald Trump was indicted as a key example, right? We would we did it together four times, David, on the air. Donald Trump was indicted. They came out with a statement. Shortly thereafter, an email blast came out to supporters, fundraising, trying to pull in funds. Donald Trump's team bragged about the millions of dollars they raised after each indictment. And David, that money that was raised, all 50 million of it, went to pay those bills. John Santucci with us, John Carl, our chief Washington correspondent, also with us. And John, there was a lot of focus just on this particular case alone and Donald Trump's uh, behavior in that courtroom, admonished by the judge, fined by the judge along the way, and it figured into this decision. I, I, it sure did. And, and, and David, before I get to what the judge said about it, just think about it. He spent upwards of 10 days in that courtroom. Uh, he testified. He would come out and give his uh, daily press conferences. He was using the courtroom uh, as a way uh, to, to be part of his campaign. But look what the judge said about Trump's testimony in this case. Overall, Donald Trump rarely responded to the questions asked, and he frequently interjected long, irrelevant speeches on issues far beyond the scope of the trial. His refusal to answer the questions directly, or in some cases at all, severely compromised his credibility. So Donald Trump's time inside that courtroom in the midst of a presidential campaign, using it as a way to boost his political prospects, it appears hurt his legal prospects. Again, the judge saying that his testimony, very strong language here, severely compromised his credibility. Um, and one, one of the things that Trump talked about constantly in those press conferences that seemed to be fixated on was the value of Mar-a-Lago, because he was accused of overstating uh, the value of Mar-a-Lago and insisted uh, that it was worth well over a billion dollars. Uh, this ruling takes some time to explain why that is simply not true. Um, the, the judge explains uh, that, um, that although Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth between a billion and a billion five today, um, he said that the judge says that would require valuing it as a private residence, which the deed prohibits, and it would have to make it the most expensive private residence listed in the county, Palm Beach County, uh, by approximately 400%. And the judge explains, and this is important uh, with, with the Mar-a-Lago property. Again, I mentioned this because this is something Trump has been fixated about, talked about not only in his appearances outside that courtroom, but talks about it in his campaign rallies. Um, Trump signed two uh, agreements uh, with the government regarding Mar-a-Lago to limit his tax exposure. Um, one was a 1995, a deed of conservation and preservation, uh, where he gave up the right to use Mar-a-Lago, he or any other owner, uh, for any purposes other than a social club. Um, and, and a secondary deed, in two, another deed in 2002, where he gave away in perpetuity the right to develop or use the property as a single family residence. So uh, that enabled Trump to significantly lower the taxes he would pay at Mar-a-Lago, but it means you can't subdivide it and, send, and, and, and put a bunch of a homes, private residence on there, which is what you would need to see the value being as high as it is. But look, bottom line, uh, uh, Trump has used this case and the other cases uh, on and on and on uh, for his campaign. Um, but in the courtroom, the judge sticks to the rule of law, sticks to the, sticks to the ruling, and is saying that, uh, that Trump has actually uh, hurt his own credibility with his own statements. John, let's, let's just talk bigger picture here uh, politically, yeah. because we've seen the polling uh, that Americans, when they're polled, who they choose, and obviously we're still far out from election day in the race for president, but when they talk about a conviction on some of these uh, criminal counts, and again, this is not 
one of those cases. They, we are still awaiting the Jack Smith trial, the trial in Georgia, the hush money case uh, here in New York. Uh, we see how the polling suddenly shifts when people are asked, would you, would you, ask, would you vote for uh, a convicted felon? Now, in this case, this deals with another part uh, and a huge part of Donald Trump's image, which is what he's really worth, what his businesses are worth, what he's worth as uh, someone who prides himself in, in decades of doing business here in New York and beyond. When you see him uh, called out, if you will, by this judge for grossly exaggerating the value of his properties and now being held accountable. And again, the numbers here at this hour, Donald Trump has now been fined $354 million uh, in this case. Both sons uh, fined $4 million each, which takes you to about $362 million. Uh, Donald Trump and his two sons have been fined for exaggerating the value of their real estate. Uh, does this poke holes in that image for those who support Donald Trump? Uh, obviously too soon to know, but again, this is a big part of the image that he presents on the campaign trail. Well, uh, Trump's entire political life uh, is an outgrowth of his contention that he is the greatest, most successful business genius, that he is fabulously wealthy because he is fabulously successful in business and would bring the same uh, 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 acumen, business acumen to, uh, to, to the government. But what you're seeing here with, with this uh, in, in incredible judgment, again, getting, accusing him, first of all, of exaggerating his wealth, but also um, uh, getting to the point where uh, there's a real question whether or not he could even pay these fines uh, on top of the fines uh, that, that he is forced to pay in the E. Jean Carroll cases, uh, not to mention all of the legal bills which John uh, just went through and that he is using uh, his political fundraising to help pay for. I mean, Donald Trump's image as a incredibly success, successful, wealthy businessman is also very much what was on trial here and, and very much in question right now. Uh, can he pay this? Now, I have to say, the other thing that strikes me here, David, is that this decision coming so closely on the heels of the E. Jean Carroll uh, decision, and before we get into the criminal cases, but this decision comes just as Donald Trump has solidified his almost total control over the Republican Party. Um, he is uh, come out and uh, he, he's, he's pushed for a replacement at the RNC. Ronna McDaniel is going to be leaving. Uh, Trump's choice uh, to run the RNC is all but certain likely to take over. He has said that he wants his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, to be the, uh, uh, the, 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 the co-chairman of the RNC uh, and has said that the purpose of the Republican Party, its entire purpose, everything that it must do, must be focused on one thing, and that is electing Donald Trump, the president of the United States. Now, one question that this raises is Donald Trump, while he was president, used the RNC to pay his legal bills. Once he became uh, a candidate uh, for president and wasn't the only Republican candidate, that ended because the RNC technically can't take sides in a Republican primary. But what's going to happen now is the, is the Republican National Committee going to be yet another engine, an engine he may really need uh, to help uh, uh, keep on top of these finances, faced with these massive fines and massive legal bills all at the same time. You speak of this pause for the RNC during this primary process, but in the meantime, as John Santucci pointed out, uh, John, by and large, Donald Trump supporters uh, in the country are paying uh, many of these legal bills for him. Uh, I mean, there are, it, it's small donors. It's uh, you know, it's donations that come in. You know, often uh, uh, less than a hundred dollars. Uh, working class people uh, who uh, have taken to fully believe his argument, his contention uh, that he is a victim of of, of a witch hunt, uh, that everybody is out to get him, and he says they're out to get me because their real target is you, and I'm the one standing in the way. Um, and it's uh, that they have they have raised. Uh, tens of millions of dollars. And as John uh, went through, uh, much of that money has gone to pay Donald Trump's legal bills. But by the way, the RNC's money also comes, uh, you know, it comes in some cases from wealthy donors, but, but also, uh, you know, comes from, uh, from small time donors, the people that you see uh, that go to those Trump rallies and have been going for years. Uh, in many ways, those people, those people that show up and to cheer him on at his rallies, uh, 
are the ones that are tapped to pay his legal bills. But now, I mean, the legal bills, as huge and massive and accumulating as they are, that's just the least of it. Now you have, you know, this judgment, which they're going to appeal, just like they're going to appeal the, the latest in the Eugene Carroll case. Uh, but, but, but this is uh, the kind of money that, that, that could face somebody in a position like Donald Trump's to have to liquidate all of their assets to, uh, uh, to pay. Um, you know, Donald Trump says he is a, you know, multi-billionaire. Well, he's going to need to be <laughs> uh, uh, to, to uh, you know, to pay what he's being fined here. Yeah, these are these extraordinary, extraordinary numbers. The Eugene Carroll case and now this case here in New York, the civil fraud trial. John Carl, our thanks to you. Again, the breaking news at this hour, uh, the judge in this case, Judge Ngoran, uh, fining Donald Trump $354 million, just more than $354 million. Uh, in the civil fraud trial, each of his sons, uh, Don Jr., Eric, uh, each uh, ordered to pay uh, $4 million for uh, exaggerating the wealth of their uh, business holdings in order to, to get better loans, to get uh, better insurance policies, the kind of thing that the attorney general had argued everyday Americans cannot do, and if they do, get in trouble every day for this, uh, and that um, Donald Trump should not be above the law was her argument all along. I want to bring in Asha Rangappa, our legal contributor, uh, former special agent, New York Division of the FBI, of course, uh, with uh, Yale. And Asha, I just wanted to ask you, because uh, you heard John Carl mention there, it's obvious this will be appealed. Uh, one of the questions that comes to mind, how do you pay for the appeal? Uh, obviously, with all of these other mounting fines that are just sort of extraordinary uh, in just the terms of what kind of money we're talking about here, uh, and, and, and how successful would or could an appeal in a case like this be? Yes, yeah, so he he is likely to appeal. Now, he would probably have to post a surety bond in order to appeal, which means that they would take a portion of the judgment, um, maybe 10%, that he has to essentially put up as collateral while the appeal goes on. And if he loses, then that gets automatically forfeited. So in this case, I mean, if you look at, say, 10% of what he owes, you know, $35 million, does he have that to put up? Um, so that's the first hurdle. The second is what would actually be appealed. This was a bench trial, which means that the judge was deciding both questions of fact and questions of law, where normally you might have a jury decide the questions of fact. Um, on appeal, the judge's determinations on those questions of fact are going to be given a lot of deference. So, for example, what his determinations were on the credibility of the witnesses, uh, the fact that he felt, as he said in the order, that he did not believe that Trump or any of the other defendants expressed any remorse. And he believed that that evinced a intent to continue to engage in this if he didn't um, institute any kind of remedy. Um, and then on the legal issue, this was a court of equity, which means that what he was looking at was how how to make this fair again, that Trump had been cheating. And how, how do we compensate New York for this unfairness? So he was disgorging profits where he was saying all of these ill-gotten gains, we need to remove from Trump and give it back to New York. So this is all based on calculations of, you know, interest he got away with not paying or things that he was able to buy by securing loans or, for, or providing false statements. Um, and so you know, it would be, I think, unlikely for on appeal for that kind of precise calculation to be an error. Um, the one thing that could have maybe he pre prevailed on is that the judge initially had canceled all of Trump's business certificates. This is known as the corporate death penalty. It's a very draconian measure. Letitia James had tried this with the NRA and the judge did not allow it. But this order actually modifies that earlier penalty. And it, he says, I'm not going to cancel all the business certificates in mass. We're going to do it on an ad hoc basis as needed by this compliance monitor that's been uh, appointed by the court. So I think this will be pretty steady on appeal, but Trump may try to appeal it.
Asha Rangalpa, a court of equity, as she points out, uh, trying to square things, if you will, after years of the judge saying that Donald Trump, uh, his business, uh, his family members who were in business with him, uh, grossly exaggerated the values of what they owned here in New York and beyond in order to secure uh, better deals, better loans, uh, access to loans that perhaps uh, everyday Americans would not get access to unless they you know, exaggerated their wealth uh, and their value as well. Asha, thank you for that. And in fact, Aaron, you and I were talking uh, off camera here about something the judge actually wrote in here about that, fully aware that the argument on the campaign trail is this is an attack, uh, this is a witch hunt, this is political in nature, but the judge lays out why he came up with the numbers that he came up with. He does, and sometimes he uses colorful language, but he's frank. He said, look, Donald Trump is not Bernie Madoff, the famous, infamous Ponzi schemer. The defendant did not commit murder or arson, but he says Trump's complete lack of contrition and remorse borders on pathological and crucially Judging, Justice Ngoran said this court finds that defendants are likely to continue their fraudulent ways unless the court grants significant injunctive relief. And so he's saying Trump's going to be a recidivist, fraudster, unless the penalty is so severe, $354 million and a ban from business in New York for the next three years is pretty severe, unless he imposed something that severe. The judge became convinced that Trump would continue to commit fraud and continue to exaggerate his wealth. But as Asha points out, the judge did not give Letitia James everything that she'd asked for. She did not. And uh, it, not quite the amount of money that Letitia James may have been close, hoping for. But close. But it's very, very close. But on the business certificates. He did not end up canceling the business certificates as the judge initially had done. And, and even then, the attorney general didn't ask him to do that. He sort of freelanced that on his own in a partial summary judgment motion, he takes that back here and instead imposes a monitor over the Trump organization. So former President Trump's business now has a semi-permanent babysitter and Trump himself cannot be involved in any of these transactions for the next three years. And as we know, he's in his late 70s, which is, as we know, young and plenty of time to do many things, but in the world of business to be held off from doing any kind of business here in New York for three years, uh, you would think is significant to someone who's made a career of, of and certainly built their career here in New York. And his kids can't do business for the next two years. So the Trump organization is in flux. Uh, and we had thought initially had the judge gone forward and canceled the business certificates, what would have happened to the Trump name on all the buildings around here? Seems like the name can stay, but the status of the company and who's going to lead it for the next couple of years, that's what's very much in question. And $354 million, David, may well eat up the remaining cash that he has on hand. And obviously they can put that on hold while they appeal, but they'll have to put up something. They're gonna, they they ha either have to put up the bond, as, as Asha says, and there there is some interest that could increase the, the penalty effectively, right. or you effectively have to put it all in escrow with the court. Uh, and I don't so know either way, it ties up the money. Who's got $354 million uh, lying around? Certainly no one's here on this desk. Uh, Aaron, thank you. I want to bring in Rachel Scott, uh, who covers Capitol Hill and the race for president for us. And Rachel, uh, as John Santucci had pointed out earlier uh, in after, after the headlines, and we've only had one that's as eye-popping as this, and that was uh, the damages after E. Jean Carroll. Now we have $354 million in fines in this case alone for Donald Trump, the civil fraud trial, uh, and the email, the uh, fundraising appeal has gone out. Just went out just minutes ago, David. So now Donald Trump facing this massive fine. His campaign, the Super PAC, already blasting out an email to his supporters asking for one million of them to start to chip in. As we have noted, this is money that the former president is using to pay for his legal fees. $50 million of it went toward that in 2023. In the short term, we have not really seen this impact the former president when it comes to Republican primary politically. He dominated in Iowa. He dominated in New Hampshire. He's ahead in South Carolina. But when you look at the long term and all that the former president is now facing, 91 criminal charges, multiple trials possibly here ongoing throughout the course of, of this election. When asked by vote, when polls asked voters whether or not they would support the former president if he is convicted, this is where you see Donald Trump start to lose his edge in a head-to-head -head matchup with President Biden. The biggest shift is among independents. He drops about 11 points. And this is all the more reason why you have rivals like Nikki Haley staying in this race. She says that Americans would not vote for a convicted felon. That's Donald Trump.
Rachel Scott with us here. And of course, uh, those are the trials still yet to come, though today's decision will certainly uh, loom large for Donald Trump himself uh, and his family uh, and the Trump organization and whether or not uh, Donald Trump supporters in the country uh, will be swayed by uh, this kind of number and the argument that the judge has made in his decision, which is uh, 354 million isn't uh, an attack. Uh, and, and the judge in his uh, decision lays out why he came up with that number, essentially saying, as Aaron Katursky said a moment ago, making the case that if it weren't a number like this, that this kind of business behavior would in fact uh, continue. Again, Donald Trump fined 354 million. Uh, each of his two eldest sons, Don Jr. and Eric Trump, both fined uh, 4 million each, and all three of them prevented from doing business in New York uh, for the next several years. Uh, John Santucci, do we have reaction from uh, the Trump Organization from Donald Trump? David, we have so much reaction. I'm just gonna flag an email that literally we all just received from our colleague, Avery Harper. Donald Trump, David, already fundraising off of this decision, playing into that conversation that you, me, Rachel Scott, and everyone were just having. Um, the reaction is remarkable coming in right now. Um, the Trump Organization claiming that, you know, this is uh, a miscarriage of justice, uh, that they, of course, plan to appeal. Similar statements from Donald Trump's attorneys, David. And the Trump Organization statement, I believe, written by the two sons, echoing that conversation I had with Eric Trump, that they believe that this was an effort by the Attorney General to go after them personally. They believe that this was a miscarriage of justice and they maintain, David, they have run a clean business, never missed a payment for any of the loans that they have out with Deutsche Bank and others that were mentioned throughout the proceedings that we saw go on for several weeks and months in downtown. And David, you got to imagine for right now, the question they're trying to figure out is with that independent arbiter coming in, what happens in the immediate future? But the one thing we do know, and Aaron mentioned this with you a couple seconds ago, the Trump name that is emblazed on buildings all around New York City for now remains, David. You heard those arguments. John Santucci, thank you, uh, from the Trump sons, from the Trump family. The judge says that's simply not the case. The evidence uh, uh, proved otherwise. And again, uh, they were found liable previously. This trial was about the damages and what kind of punishment they would face. Today, we learned it this afternoon that the judge uh, in this civil fraud trial uh, again, fining Donald Trump, the former president, $354 million and each of his sons, $4 million each, which takes you to about $362, $363 million. Uh, the Attorney General, Letitia James, had asked for $370 million. She did not get that number, though the judge came very close. And again, uh, both Donald Trump uh, and his two sons prevented from doing business here in New York for the next couple of years. Our coverage continues on ABC News Live, abcnews.com. For those of you here in the East, many of you have local news starting at 4 o'clock Eastern. And I'll be back with the entire team for World News Tonight a little later today. I'm David Muir in New York. Good day. This has been a special report from ABC News.